Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. We're very excited today to have Bob joining us, the CEO of Weebye, to talk about vectors and what they mean to us when it comes to generative AI and AI in general and kind of what the future looks like. So it's going to be a, a great discussion with someone that's been at the top of the curve when it comes to innovating in that space. So it's going to be uh, very interesting. If you have questions for Bob, start asking the questions now because we already have about uh, 30 plus questions for Bob from social media. So start asking with a queue uh, so we know it's a question in the chat below. Uh, with that, if you've not subscribed to the show yet and you've yet to uh, get your email every week about the next episode, do that on uh, the website in the nick of time.tv so you can be notified uh, for the next episode. Uh, we're not going to have a, a show next week. We're going to see uh, you guys in, in two weeks. It's going to be a very interesting discussion as well. Uh, so stay tuned for that. You get a, an email if you go uh, subscribe to inthenickoftime.tv. Uh, also, of course, it's kind of relevant today because we're going to be talking about generative AI and, and open AI and all the stuff we see happening in this new uh, game-changing technology, uh, completely disrupting everything we know and, and how much is that going to be uh, in the next uh, 20 years. Nobody really knows, but it's going to be uh, definitely interesting uh, to pay attention to what's going to happen. And if you've yet to try Assage, go to assage.ai, create an account for free. You'll be able to get access to GPT-3.5 for, you know, Cohere, Google Bard, uh, DaVinci, Flentify, Falcon, and so on. And, you know, we kind of uh, help you bring your data and train data. In fact, we use Weavia on the product. And Weavia was picked not only because it's able to work uh, air-gapped and, uh, on government clouds, but it's also uh, really top notch when it comes to security and scanning results. And uh, we were able to partner with ChainGuard uh, to be able to bring uh, a container that's uh, really um, has a very small number of CVEs to be able to be uh, approved and accredited uh, for government use. So uh, go check it out. Uh, and of course, you'll see with Assage uh, the ability to create plugins and integrate with your API data sets and so on. So a lot of great features. We have a great video on Assage.ai. Go check it out. Uh, again, we have a discount right now. Uh, uh, let's let's beat China, uh, which gives you uh, five dollar off uh, forever. So for twenty five bucks, you can get access to uh, uh, to our dear Assage and be able to ask questions and uh, augment it with your data and uh, uh, see all the plugins, uh, Git uh, integrations, and uh, Elastic, uh, MongoDB, SQL. You name it. We have so many integrations to be able to tap into your data sets. Uh, so go check that out. Uh, we're going to bring Bob in a second, but you know, I wanted to uh, give you a quick rundown of, uh, of his background. Of course, he's a technology entrepreneur, a technologist, and uh, even a, a media artist uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, he's a co-founder of Wavier and the chairman of the Creative Software Foundation. In uh, March 2016, uh, he started the open source vector search engine Wavier. And you're back in 2016, maybe he knew, but we didn't know how much that's going to uh, disrupt industry. And, you know, uh, it's been a, a game changer when it comes to, of course, enabling teams to augment LLMs and uh, generative AI capabilities to bring your data and be able to then uh, go beyond the limitation of the uh, hallucinations and the, the issue we see uh, with gener generative AI. So it's a, it's a real game changer. And the fact that, uh, you know, Bob was kind enough to bring this to the open source industry and uh, making sure that uh, this can run air gap. You know, a lot of competition, but very few of them can actually run air gap and run, you know, inside of your Kubernetes cluster uh, without depending on a bunch of SaaS um, APIs. And so, you know, and, and you compare, of course, with some other competitors um, that have Chinese involvement. Uh, that's a non starter, of course, for, for us here. Uh, and uh, of course, you have none of that. None of that with the team and and the Wevia team. If you if you've been to their Slack channel, they are uh, ex exceptional. You know, helping people. Uh, don't care about money. They, they don't even ask you if you're a paid customer or not. But they're gonna help you. And uh, it's just a, an awesome awesome team. Um, so you know, Bob published and uh, has lectured about open source software business model and the positioning of uh, broadly applicable uh, infrastructure software, databases, and search engine. Uh, and during a presentation uh, for the TEDx uh, University in, in Amsterdam, he shared his ideas about the, the evolvement of language impact ideas in software development. So if you've not connected to him on LinkedIn, I recommend you do that. And I recommend you join the Slack uh, chat of Weavier 
a lot of great discussions, a lot of innovation happening, and it's kind of becoming this uh, you know, centralized brain and 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 really uh, interconnecting, you know, pretty much everything you can think about. And it's uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen in that market. But if you if you want to, you know, have a play and not be putting your head in the sand when it comes to what's going to happen in generative AI, uh, you definitely want to pay attention to this stuff because that's going to be a big piece of the disruption that we're going to be facing in the next, uh, you know, two, three, four, five years, and maybe even six months. It's moving so fast. So with that, I'd like to bring Bob now on the show. Welcome. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, uh, for having me Nick. It's great to be here. Yeah, no, we're we're excited because you know you, you have such a breadth of knowledge, and you know honestly, it was so it's so kind of you to not only give back to the open source community with all your work. Your team is exceptional. You know, I've told you that before, but uh, they've helped us uh, again and again. We try to to give back when we can, but you know, I think it's been uh, exceptional to see. Uh, you know, not only their uh, focus on security, but also in you know creating a better product, better features. Uh, we picked Weaviate at the very beginning for us here at S Age. Uh, it was a no-brainer, honestly. It was just common sense. Um, I don't think I even hesitated, uh, honestly, and I think it was a great decision. Uh, Sally, don't regret it. And you know, it brings everything we needed, and it does it uh, with full control and, and complete complete flexibility. So, you know, people go go check it out uh, on their website. But you know, before that, uh, I like to give you a chance to uh, give give us a little bit about your journey and what you've been up to, and then we're going to get into the real me. Uh, the title of this episode, you know, of course, was created, and we've done it together uh, with uh, Chat GPT, like always, well, with Sage, but you know, GPT four as we always do here. And I like that vector connection, exploring the future of AI, right? And we're going to dig into this uh, future together. And I think you, more than most people on the show that we had, have this vision uh, way beyond you know what most people can even comprehend. So it's going to be a great, great discussion. So thanks for joining us. Uh, th th thanks again for having me. So, uh, well, to, to answer your question about my journey, so I've been I've been working in software for a for a very long time, and I I always like to say that that has to do a little bit. I'm gonna date myself now, but the um, uh, uh, I'm I, I'm born in in or in '85, and the um, uh, when I was like around um, you know when I was like 14, 15 years old, we got like then we got a uh, computer with an internet connection, and a lot of people wanted stuff online. Uh, uh, and they didn't know how to build websites or those kind of things. And that's really how my career started. So that's very, and I, I was very young when I started that. So um, I've been working in tech for a, for a long time. Now, in that journey, I was, and I, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but I think it was like 2015, 2016, something like that. I came in, uh, I, I came in touch with um, uh, machine learning models and the, the language, the newer language models, the, what was back then seen as new. And um, the, the at some point the idea was born that I wanted to solve the problem of unstructured data. Right? So they say, okay, we're dealing with unstructured data. We somehow need to uh, relate it to each other. And these vector embeddings played a role in that. So basically, back then I started to play with. I believe I believe it was Glov. I, I could be wrong. Could be something else, but I think Glov. And Glov, it's still it's still on GitHub, so you can see you can download it. And what you basically get, you get a you get a CSV file with a word. Like a single word, so it was back then called word embeddings, and that word had a vector embedding next to it. And I think in a bit we'll dive into what these vector embeddings are. But the um, uh, what you basically could do is like you start to you know you could start to calculate with words, and rather than storing data based on uh, just keywords or those kind of things, you could start to um, uh, um, store data and information based on the on the embeddings. So that is kind of how the journey started. Then, of course, a lot of research was done. So transformers were released and those kind of things. And kind of on the on, on the back of that, the um, uh, the database grew because people were like, hey, wait a second, now we can do search with these um, ML models and we need a database for that. So the first thing that we saw was that most people started to look at like what I always like to call like better search and recommendation. What's also interesting, what you said, Nick, was about the about the community because the reason that I think it's important that we're you know generous to our community is because it's actually people like you and your team that actually tell us what they need, 
right? So, so one thing that we've learned is like everything that we do, like around security or um, a, a certain type of integrations that we have, or the fact that we have hybrid search, uh, we can maybe talk about that in a bit as well. Those are things that we learn from the community. So the community starts to play around with the database and they ask us questions and things that they want. So that's how we learn. So it's like a, you work together on these on these kind of things. Um, so what we started to see was that there was like a, a new use case started to emerge. And that was only like by the end of, that was it's very tightly related to the release of, of um, uh, a chat GPT and the grown interest in generative models. And that was that the vector database was starting to play a role in, um, in harmony with the generative models. So that basically meant, and everybody who's used the generative model now, especially if you, for example, use you know, like something like ChatGPT, is that sometimes the models are like, you know, I'm trained in 2021, so I can't answer that question, or that I don't know anything about what you're asking me. And of course, what people want to build are these kind of systems based on their own data. And uh, that that is where something is it's um it's something called rack so um um start to play a, a role where you actually basically say, okay we're going to inject information in the model and we have like a primitive form of of, of rack and that's like that you basically inject it in the prompt but there are also more novel ways of doing that so all of a sudden besides these use cases of like better search better recommendation now all of a sudden this new use case emerged and that was that you could start to use um a, a defective database basically to make the uh, the model stateful with your own data right so you could just store or delete and update your own data and use all that niceness from these generative models so that was what happened and it's actually all pretty recently and that is kind of what's that combination of all these things together that was like a perfect storm on, on which everybody um, is now building. And what you're doing is a great example of that, right? So it's a, um, uh, that's an example of such an, an application. So a lot of people are um, uh, trying it out, kicking tires, using open source, some use paid service, you know, whatever they, they need to get their stuff done. And, but we also see now the first big ones going to production. And that's of course, uh, um, that is very exciting that we know that actually, and you know, end customers, they, that like in the end that goes in the many, many thousands of end customers actually, you know, get access to these, to these tools. And that's like, you know, that's super exciting. And I, I guess maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, what you've seen in terms of adoption, you know, um, obviously uh, good timing, you know, with open AI releasing chat GPT, did you, did you, did you feel like you knew it was coming or you just got lucky and <laughs> it was just perfect timing with uh, you know the big launch with Weave Eight and and all no, that, you know tied together, that was just that was all just perfect storm. I think what's important to bear in mind is that these models uh, that were used for for these generative purposes they already existed. It's not it's not that something new came with that right. So we could already see the signs of something like this coming, but the question was, what will the application be that is the big eye opener? Right. So how right. what will happen in the world that people go like, oh, now we see. Right? right. And because we need to bear in mind that the that. So, for example, I'm you know, I run an infrastructure company. So the world where we where we live, right, is that's like with with developers and, 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 and techies and, and, and researchers and, you know, hackers, those kind of people. So um, these people, they kind of saw that, but they were also inside organizations. They were trying to show what the value was, right? So so they, they tried to figure it out and show like, you know, also senior management and stuff in organizations, like <laughs> look at what the value is that we're getting here. And it was sometimes still a tough sell. So the better search, better recommendation was, that was kind of okay to do, but really that new thing that was hard. And then because of that launch of ChatGPT, it was just the eye opener that just, um, um, let's call them uh, normal <laughs> business people that they're like, oh, now we see. Now we see what this could be. Everybody could us. see, even the non, the non geek, the non -geek uh, people could, could see yes, it in front of them. So, exactly. Uh, democratizing exactly. it, right, for everybody. That, yes, that's, you know, pretty exactly. rare, right? I mean, most technology innovation takes, you know, five, 10 years to, to even get to the hands of everybody. But now, GPT was able to really do that, and that's awesome, you know, for, for OpenAI and for the rest of the industry. So yeah. when you look at the adoption now, right, you said uh, finally uh, some teams are, are moving to production and doing some real volume and, and good, uh, you know, good engagement. Um, what kind of company or at least sectors do you feel like are leading 
with the adoption of uh, of generative AI today? Yeah, so the, the answer to this question is going to be a little bit of a cliche answer, but it's just it's the truth. So the um, uh, the first adopters are actually um, the tech companies, right? So those are companies. in. So one of the upsides that you have as, as being an infrastructure company like we are is that anybody can be your customer. Right. right. So it, not it's not a. We're not competing with them. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So so you, you kind of you, so it, it, it doesn't matter if it's in banking, in publishing, in whatever. Right. So, um, uh, um, it's more the persona hey, in these organizations that you focus on. But the industry that we saw go first were like the the, the tech in you know was the tech industry. So for example. Uh, I don't know, um, tech companies focusing on the insurance uh, vertical, tech companies focusing on publishing, those kind of, so mm -hmm. so those very tech-savvy companies or companies that were basically making their, you know, their living of uh, selling high tech in a cer certain vertical, that's what we saw first. And that is a, uh, and I think that makes it, that kind of makes a lot of sense because bear in mind that related to that, that remark that I just made about ChatGPT, I think also people were, uh, think like oh boy you know we've been working for years on something right so for years on this we're working now there's this new paradigm right um right that presents disrupting itself. everything they've done yes yes. Yep. yes so they have to move they have to move fast and they need the tooling to achieve that right? so that is that is something that i see the most mm. and beyond the, the tech guys who do you who do you would would you say all the the quick next you know followers are you seeing stuff in in banking or uh, the financial industry. What, 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 where else do you see uh, momentum? I guess. I think uh, I'm, fair, I'm. 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 I'm happily surprised that I. I. So what have I seen recently? I've seen recently um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, retailers, e-commerce, wholesale, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen banking, of course, insurance because insurance yeah. is is very important because the. Um, uh, the large language models, of course, you know, uh, in insurance, in publishing, of course. Uh, I've seen the first, and I have to admit that I'm not sure yet what the the exact use case are because I just very recent thought, but I start to see the first gaming uh, uh, mm. use case as well. So I was ah. very intrigued by that because you know that just certain things that you have like a feeling like this can be big, for example, in gaming, and then you sure. just want to know like oh, who, who, what what game company Who's gonna is going to do something, kind of right? Yeah. And, and you try to educate the market, you try to help the market, but um, you know it's it's it, they need to they need to see the light. But bear in mind that all, especially of course most of the models are large language models. So companies that are very heavy on language, they tend to right. move first. Sure. And you know obviously we're pretty big uh, as sage in, in government, but also in financial yeah. industry now. We we signed up forty five hundred government teams and. 950 companies, you know, in three months, which is pretty amazing. Um, who else Hello. do you see? Do you see any other activity on the government side uh, with maybe with other governments than what we did uh, with that sage? Yeah. So, so, um, so I'm, I'm from, uh, I'm Dutch. So I, th I think very logically we saw like the, uh, the, uh, right. the, the Dutch, the Dutch government, right. They uh, have been work was that was more in the, um, that was on the side of uh, economic affairs again, which mm. kind of makes sense because they just a lot of text. Uh, but we also, you know, we all spoke with people in the, on the, on the side of the U S so it's like, it's in, in the government. So it's very interesting. I think what's in, in, interesting to bear in mind in specifically when you talk about government, is that if you have a, a piece of infrastructure like a database, back in the day, you just had a database and then you needed to, you know, support certain things to, you know, support the government use case, as you said earlier. What's interesting is that there's now, for these use cases, a second thing added to the mix, and that's the model, right? So right. no no model, there's no use for a vector database if you don't have a machine. Right, you can't do right? much so, without the model, that's right. Exactly. So, so a lot of questions, um, and this is, I think this is also, you know, the, an obvious sense, but the uh, questions are like, so where does the software run? How do we integrate with the models? Where are these right. models coming from? Those kind of things. So those kind of questions we we um, we get a lot, but you know, we're like, we're early in that journey, but it's super excited to see that as well. It's very cool. Yeah, no doubt. All right, so let's, you know, for people that don't really understand much about the topic, let's set the stage, you know, with uh, the basics, right? And so let's look first at what is a vector, right? Let's start there and then we, we can go <laughs> to the more complex stuff. Yeah, so so a vector is a the easiest way to think about it. I like to I like to explain this in in metaphors because then it's easier for people to to visualize, uh, if you will, is uh, to think about a representation in uh, in space. Uh, 
So for example, if you look at a map, right? So that can be, I'm, I'm currently, I'm, I'm now in New York. So if you look at a, at a map of New York, right? Then uh, you want to move from one street to another, you do that in two dimensions, right? So things are placed in a dimensional space. And if you go to a supermarket, for example, you are in a three dimensional space. And basically what the, the embeddings do that the machine learning models generate is that they, based on the, uh, the data that they're trained on, is that they place things in relation to each other in that space. So a way to think about it is that, um, uh, uh, for example, if you have a, um, uh, um, a, a, a word, for example, if you th think about it from the perspective of words, if you have a word like apple, then that's more closely related in that space to like fruit and banana than it is to, for example, a car, right? Because a car is something completely different. So what we can do, we can also, by the way, not only do that with text, but you can also do it with images and audio and those kind of things. So what the vector does is that it gives a, a, a representation in space. And now the thing is, as you also know from, um, uh, so back to my city example, is uh, if I meet somebody and I look at a t 2D map, then I can get to the location or the street where I need to be. But if I have to go up, right, I need to have a third dimension. So I need to know where to go. And these vector embeddings, so they're often not two-dimensional and also, also often in, or not often, all, almost all cases, not two-dimensional, three-dimensional, because we cannot, con you know, contain enough information in just two or three dimensions. So they're often like, it starts often from like 90. And, and uh, for example, um, 768 is a number that's seen a lot, or the open AI embeddings are 1530 something. <laughs> I, I'm 36, I think, or 38. And so what you basically do is that the, the more of these points you have in space, the more information you can capture. And that's what a vector is. So it's a, it's a data type. It's a new data type that we have in databases next to like um, um, text, uh, 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 numbers, integers, those kind of things. We now have the data type of the vector embedding. And, you know, with a new data type, you see, you know, new new databases. So that's um, that's what a vector is. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So now we have kind of the basics, right? So, okay, these vector, you know, uh, used um, to empower, you know, LLMs and, and, and augment data, right, um, uh, from the enterprise. And then, you, when you think about it, you know, what's the difference between the vector AI model and the generative AI model? Yeah, so it is basically what comes out of the model. I mean, also what goes in, but mostly what comes out. So if we have like, you have all kinds of models that do things, but the, the ones that we commonly see is like, for example, you have the type of model, we call it a, like a vectorization model. And what it basically does, you can give it, for example, text, or you can give it an image or you can give it audio and it turns it into that vector representation. So um, if if I take the sentence, hey, for example, in the nick of time, I can give that to the model, but what comes out of the, the, uh, the vector model is that vector representation that we can store. The generative AI model though is, and what's in the name, it generates uh, something. So often, so uh, as we talk about like the GPT kind of applications, in this case, it generates text. So word after word after word. But bear in mind, text is just a use case. It can also be uh, an image or it can also be audio or those kind of things. So often for these, what we call Gen AI use cases is that they both work with each other in harmony. So you use the, the first model to, um, uh, uh, to, to vectorize the content to store in the database. And you use the other model, for example, to create an interactive uh, 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 engine or generate something based of the data that you're retrieving from the database. So that's the difference between these types of models. It's often not one model. It's like multiple models that, that do that and they work in harmony uh, 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 with each other. Yeah, that makes sense. So so now, you know, you're ingesting data, right? You have this uh, uh, vector database of your contents, right? So you have the plain texting, you know, version, then you have the vectors, the vectors now, you know, you can use that, right, to query against your database to extract uh, results that would be relevant to the prompt or to the discussion uh, by using different ways, right, to uh, to effectively uh, select the uh, matches. So, so when you think about that, 
right? You guys bring a, a lot of features, right, into VVA to uh, effectively help the teams uh, decide which one to, you know, let's say you have a thousand entries, you're not going to pass, you know, a thousand entries to your prompt. You want to, you know, based on the token uh, context limitation and stuff, you, you may, you know, pass two, three, four, five at best. So how do you think about, you know, kind of querying the data, database and extracting the relevant information and how, how do you guys do that? Yeah, so this is a uh, thank you for this. This is an excellent question because the, the, the thing is this. So what we've learned in, in, in practice is that from the vector database perspective, doing pure vector search alone. So what we mean with that is just, you know, you have all these embeddings and then you might generate another embedding and then you do similarity search to say like, okay, these are, for example, if you have 10 million documents and you have a question, say, okay, what are the top five documents that I need or which documents contain the answer to my, to my question? We've learned that in the majority of situations, pure vector search alone is not enough. So doing that in combination with more traditional uh, 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 keyword search functions, for example. Think about if you, for example, have a very specific name or you have an internal product or project name, uh, then you know you you probably want to match that based on a on more on a keyword based uh, matching, and that is what we call hybrid search. So where you basically mix these things together, and we believe from the perspective of Viviate that we just need to do that under one roof. Another example is filtering. So sometimes there are situations where let's say that you store products, right? And we've so you might have a query where you say, okay, I want to do a vector search on, uh, I don't know, Nike shoes uh, for the summer, right? That's a, that's a beautiful uh, example of like a, a vector search question. But you said, okay, they need to be, I don't know, less than 150 bucks. That's a filter that you said. So we know from, from how people use the database that they want to mix these more traditional filters with these modern vector search um, uh, uh, capabilities. And that's what's coming out of the database. And then, so that means that if you have a generative AI use case, basically what you do, you need to, if, if it's a uh, naive uh, 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 rack um, uh, uh, thing, so we want to inject something in the model, then, um, sorry, in the prompt of the model, then we somehow need to collect the right documents from the database. And you want to do it in a combination or you, by using hybrid uh, uh, search. So that's an example of that. Yeah, that's exactly how we do it. In fact, you know, we actually found that uh, we're doing it both by similarities and hybrid search. And then we compile the two results, yeah. aggregate and, and use that as a, as a you know, final uh, thing and then we also have you know uh, Bing and, and Google as additional um, items we add to the to the pie when we do you know live live queries so that's interesting yeah um, yeah so maybe so if we if we quickly if I may if we can quickly double click on that on that that uh, uh, that rack for us so that that's a, the abbreviation stands for retrieval augmented generation. So what you basically, so you do generation. So if you look at it in reverse order, right? So we do generation, but it's augmented by retrieving something. So right. the what you just said, that is the retrieval part. So we need to tell the generative model what it needs to be based on, right? So, so we ask it a right. question and then we tell you, base it on the following information that we're giving you. That's the retrieval part. And that is something... Um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, that you know that's being solved in these types of uh, uh, integrates like exactly like what what you're doing. But again, I would I can't stress this enough. Pure similarity search to do the retrieval right is often not enough. The power sits in the combination. Right. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. Sometimes you don't really know why, but you know, um, in terms of the same query or very similar queries, you would think you would get similar results. But you know, hybrid sometimes gets you better results and. Sometimes similarity gets you uh, also better results. So I, I, we ended up saying, you know why we're going to do both and <laughs> aggregate that and, and, and use that as a compounded result. And, you know, for, for people that really, you know, uh, need to understand the issue with the LLMs, right, being pre-trained and having pre-biased and, and existing knowledge, right? If you want to override that and you want to augment the knowledge, you want to pass into the prompt, right, these embeddings and these um, this data to to help the bot make, make uh, effectively the LLM make, make better um, you know, uh, and give better information, right? And so if, if I ask, you know, who I am 
and I give my bio. So it's going to do a pretty good job summarizing that and, and, and giving you that insight. Now, you know, what's interesting mm -hmm. is cases where, let's say you have a database of resumes, right? You have, you have 500 resumes, right? If you ask, you know, who is Bob, it's going to do a pretty good job because, you know, Bob, there's so many Bobs and he's going to extract the top, you know, the top five or whatnot. And then you're going to give that and he's going to be able to give your bio. But now if you were to ask, you know, how many, um, how many uh, developers code in Python and you have, you know, 500 of them, that's a whole nightmare because now, you know, first you couldn't just extract the, the 500 resumes and give that to to the to the prompt because it's going to go above your your context uh, limitation there of tokens. So so we had to build a lot of you know features to enable that. Also tapping into databases, APIs, and other things. What do you feel like is the future of these kind of use cases where you would have to ingest the data in a different way, or you know, or do like almost like a, a an aggregate query or something where it gets a little bit more complex and you know just using similarity or or hybrid ser hybrid search what could be the solution when it comes to really extracting you know if i want to know count of how many i have right you know of, of python developers so this is this is a this is a, a another great question so the so the um, to ask you a question of what i think think or hope that the future is 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 this so Currently, the information that we get from, if you purely use a generative model, then the, inf the data that we're getting and the knowledge that we're getting is from the, from the model itself, right? So now we have like, we have a problem. So I always like to refer to that problem like that. I say the model is stateless, so, so it doesn't contain state. And uh, so the database is a way to bring state to the model. Now, there are two things here. So the first thing is, um, and I'll, I'll get to your second question through this, right? So the first thing is this: the if the but the models are very big, right, and it takes a lot of time to do inference on them, right? So in production, that's sometimes you know problematic. So the thing is, like, well, if we don't need the model anymore for its knowledge, we just need it for its, for example, language understanding. Right. We can compress a lot of things, right? So you, the model becomes smaller. A lot of research is happening in that space, and I even I've seen some startups of which I believe that that there's some are still in stealth, but that but I believe that they that they are working on, which is very exciting for customers, right? Because and users, because then they they know that it becomes easier to operate these these models. Because now we're just going to say, the model is just going to say like I want something from the database. The database does its its effective search and it returns that information back to the database. So that's that's one thing. The second just thing to pause that you on, a, on a second, right? Yeah. It, it, there is also a point, right? When I compare, you know, open source models that don't have the same volume of knowledge than, you know, Ch ChatGPT 3.5 or 4, for example, the model, like you said, might be capable of doing summarization, extraction, you know, all these different kind of features, right? Uh, they don't have the same knowledge. Uh, you can augment the knowledge by bringing on data. That's a lot of work. And you also need to stop predicting what people are going to start asking, right? And of course, maybe you know what they're going to be asking, or maybe you don't. But I always felt like, well, the reason why ChatGPT was so successful is because it could answer anything, you know, number one. Number two, the other piece of that is it's easier to add the delta, right, than we have to train also the basics of life, you know? So there's a balance there. And, I, you know, I, I see the value of open source models, and I think it's going to grow and get better and, you know, and it's great to be able to start with a smaller GPU and not a need to spend you know hundreds of millions to train train all this stuff, and I love it. But I also you know counter that with like okay, there's also a lot of good to have a great model that you don't have to train on everything for it to be able to also sometimes come up to conclusion that maybe you would not be able to get to without the existing knowledge plus your data, you know enterprise data on top of it. Right? There's kind of a balance there between the two. Yes. So, so let me let me let me try to give a metaphor for this, right? So, I, I have a metaphor that I sometimes use to also make this make this points, right? So, back in the day, in the pre-internet uh, era, right, a lot of uh, families at home they had a uh, uh, they had an encyclopedia set, right, at home. So, now you can do two things, right? So, you can ask a human to just read from A to Z everything that's in the in the encyclopedia set and try to remember and as much as they can. 
which is a nice party trick because then people and you know they they know a lot of trivia and and they know a lot of stuff. Or you can t take that human and say like, we're gonna learn you how to as efficiently as possible use the index that's in the in right. the in the back of the and encyclopedias. Right. Yeah. So you just need to understand the question. So for example, what's the distance between the moon and the Earth? You just need to understand that question, and then you need to quickly go to like, okay. Uh, index moon okay what's the and, and earth distance right and you do the distance calculation so now what that human needs to do in the, the 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 brain capacity needed to get that question answered is far less than memorizing everything that's in that whole encyclopedia set if that's even possible right so right um uh, what you then get is like the then the if now we bring that back to the models like you need you kind of can foresee a smaller model right that just parses the question and and so like, okay, I understand that I need to figure stuff out related to the moon, earth, distance, and I'm gonna look in the database, right? And I know how to ask that information from the database and how to ask that is in the form of these vector embeddings. Right? So I know that the type of vector embedding that I need to send to the database to get an answer. So now to your question, if you have all these resumes and these kind of things, if you have a tiny model that just understands that question, it's like, I don't know the answer but I'm going to ask it from the database, which is the encyclopedia set, and return the answer, then you get this very efficient way of uh, uh, working together. And if that's going to come from, uh, to be honest, I'm super agnostic from which model that comes. So that can be an open source model, that can be closed source model, you know, whatever works for people. Um, uh, 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 but I think that is that is the future we're going towards. So, 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 so do you see in the example of counting resumes, right, which is not just extracting... You know your resume or my resume right it's really counting let's say how many python developers we have which you could do with a query right with wavy there's that that query ability with you know graphql and, and to write that query do you see the model writing the query effectively and asking the question to the to the to the vector database is that how you you picture it in your head in terms of how the model would execute the task uh Yes, kind of. So it's like a the, the 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 problem that needs to be resolved is like how can the model understand and parse the question, right? Without having the answer to the question, right? 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 Um, he doesn't have uh, the so number, but a, he knows he needs to count, right? So he needs to count, right? So he doesn't know the number, but he knows he needs to count. Yes, exactly. So it's just gonna say like, okay. I understand. So if I if you ask the model, okay, what's what's uh, two plus two? It needs to understand. Like, okay, I have a number, and I need to add that to that other to that other number, and I'm gonna ask that from a different source. So currently, the generative models. I mean, I don't know for all generative models, but the, especially the generative models that we can see, the reason that it answers two plus two is four, is because somewhere on the internet in a text they've it it, right. it, it wrapped that right. It because trained on that. So, yeah. Yeah. It was written there. It's training. It's not. It's probably not doing two plus two itself. Right. Yeah. Right. So if you if you if you do, if you uh, and I have to admit that I don't know with the with the latest models right now, but just you know the recent models or open source models. If you ask them like, what is like five thousand twelve on the thirty three plus right. and it's another random know. number? It is not gonna know. So, but what you but want he knows how is to code it. So, so, but he knows how to code it, right? So often, what we end yes. up doing is yes, coding it and then execute the code and get the re the response. That's right. Exactly, exactly. So you want the model to say, okay, I understand. I mean, I'm I'm using I'm using language that we use as like for other humans, but for lack of a, di a better terminology, you want the model. To understand, like, oh, th the goal of this question is that it as like it wants to sum up two numbers. So it's just gonna right. say, okay, I, I need you need to do something for me. Here you have a number, here you have another number, and sum them up for me. And then whatever answer it gets back, it will say, oh, you know, the sum of that plus that is that. So right, and it's not doing the math; can... it's just pulsing, pulsing yes. the, the the question, and and sending it to the right place to to be executed and get the reply back without understanding of whether or not the answer will be right or not. Yeah, exactly. And just on a, if I may, as a, on a quick side note uh, that people might find this funny, there's, there are these questions that people ask to, um, uh, to figure out how well that, uh, that the model is able to parse these kind of things. So um, um, uh, you get questions like, um, I, I believe one question I recently heard is like, 
um, it, you have a room, you have a house with uh, uh, four rooms. Every room uh, has three yellow walls and one white wall. And after three years, uh, all um, white uh, uh, um, walls turn yellow as well. So after five years, how many yellow rooms are there? Uh, walls are there? Would, those yeah, kind of right. questions. Those kind of questions. People ask the model to see how well it figures out these kind of things. And the latest models do pretty well, to be honest. But uh, the the problem there is that it has a lot of. Um, it needs to store a lot of, um, uh, uh, um, you know, knowledge in itself, if you will. So that's a. But there's a lot of research happening there. So it's that is super exciting and it's going super fast because we should not forget the end goal. And the end goal is to you know to make sure that the that the um, that the users and the, and the customers get get valuable insights. I think an, another upside of doing this with a database is that a question we get a lot is like, how do we know where it got the information from, right? So how do we know right. that what it's saying? Where, it's, well, if you have a database in the mix, that's very yeah, easy. Okay, this right. the, 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 this yeah, was the a reference. reference. So right, yes, which so, is how yeah. we did. It. We yeah. were the first one to do this. I have to say, before everybody else, and and showing the the uh, reference before ChatGPT and everybody else even but references and Bing and, and whatnot. So completely, you know, yeah. it's, so you need to make sure it's not a black box. You know, that's so important. That's right. No, but you know what it is, um, Nick? It's like a, I'm, so this is, this goes back to the beginning of our conversation. This is why I'm such a big believer in, in like open source, but also in making. I always try to ask people make stuff because um, before you know it, you get into this very theoretical um, uh, um, exercise of like you know how would what's important. You were just building right with your team, and you were at some point you were like, oh wait a second, people want to see the reference, right? So we're going to show yeah, them the reference, right. and right. yeah, and that is a uh, uh, and I really believe in that that model of operating because it's just together we have like this hive mind going. We help each other when when people like yeah, so it's always this, these things always come in waves. So when you, for right. example, mentioned that this was of importance, others started to mention that as well. So we're like, oh, sure. this is important. So let's help our users to do this. So that's right. That is kind of how that works. Yeah. So, you know, when you look back again at the example of of counting resumes and not just extracting the the five resume that match closer to the uh, to the question, but really counting how many developers do Python, right? Would you see people using effectively, uh, you know, something like GPT-4 to generate the GraphQL query to then query Weavia, get the, re the response back? I mean, we do some of that here at, at Assage to go beyond the similarities and, and the, uh, you know, um, the hybrid search and we do it also with, with you know, another example is Postgres or, or Elastic. You know, we have integrations with uh, Postgres or Elastic, whatever, right? And you can, so when you ask a question to the bot, what, what we do is is effectively ask the bot to, to convert the plain text question to a SQL query. If the SQL query doesn't work, we make it self-reflect on its mistake and it fixes its own mistake with the error message. Usually it's able to fix that mistake and fix the query, then run the query, get a response back. Do you see people also doing that in like the counting use cases, aggregation stuff, right? With GraphQL, you know, WVA queries? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. But I think that we even already see the, the next generation on top of that as well. And that is so, to take your example, is that um, let's say that you, uh, you said like Python, but let's say that we have TypeScript, right? So for those who are listening who don't know, so TypeScript is like a, a static type, I guess, of JavaScript. It's big Java. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, probably exactly. knows Java better, but that's okay. Exactly. Well, to, to make more, so let's say that you have like all these resumes, and all these resumes they um, they have or Python developers or uh, uh, Java developers or JavaScript developers, right? So now you ask your first question, and you say, okay, uh, we're looking for people who can write, you know, TypeScript. And the database says, Sira, there's just nobody who does TypeScript. So then the next question you want to ask, like, okay, so who could we ask to help us with TypeScript? And if you know, if the model knows that TypeScript is like a, a static type of JavaScript, then it might say, well, we don't have any TypeScript people, but we have JavaScript people. Probably right. easiest for them to learn TypeScript. 
And that's where it becomes very interesting. And this is what I mean with the paradigm shift that's happening right now. We are so used to, um, to, to even if we use Google search that we use like keyword based kind of searches to match on that. That we right. really can go to a conversational style with our database so that we can ask the database, figure out for me, you know, who should we approach about this TypeScript question because there is zero TypeScript resumes. But that's database. a great example because you just proved that, you know, you, you would probably not have trained as a company, you would probably not have trained a model to teach it that TypeScript is derived, you know, uh, from JavaScript. Uh, but yeah, if, if the model knew that, so it happened because it, it learned it from the internet or whatnot. Then it would make that connection that it would not have made if you didn't, you know, if you didn't know that. And so that, that's kind of proved my point also in the fact that sometimes it's good to have a model that's broader than you think you need because it's going to be able to, to find relationship between things that, you know, you didn't even think of training it to do, right? Exactly, exactly. And that is kind of the, um, uh, that's the powerful thing. And so what you want to get to is that the model goes like, okay, I understand the question. So let me figure out what actually the difference is between JavaScript, uh, uh, Python, and uh, uh, Java. And let me see how, we re how they relate to TypeScript. Right. And then it asks the question like, oh, okay, so I now figured out that that's probably JavaScript. Okay, let's now query the database uh, with another query where we say, okay, show me things related to... Um, uh, Usually that's a uh, chain of queries, data. right? So people understand it's not going to make do that in one go. It's going to cut the, into tasks and, and then, you know, do different steps and, and kind of come to that conclusion, right? It's not a one one step thing. Yes, and I think, yes, exactly. It, it, this is very important. So it's it's a multi-step pipeline, right? And, um, uh, and one thing that I've been super impressed with when it comes to the models is that the sophistication right so let, if we stay stay with our example right with our metaphor is that the situation where you go like let's say that it now finds javascript developers for typescript but it has one javascript developer that writes i don't know uh, c plus plus then it can say like well then we have this javascript uh, um, um, developer who also knows another static language, right? So this person also knows uh, a C++, so probably you want to reach out to this person. And it's, it's pretty sophisticated in those kind of things. And I've been very impressed by that. I was I was not expecting that it would be so uh, so rapidly so good. Do, do, do you have a, I have a lot of fear when it comes to security, right? Because we're delegating tasks to models with very little transparency in terms of what they're going to do. Um, and what kind of conclusion they're going to come up with. Um, what's your fear in terms of, you know, like you look at AutoGPT and some of these tools, they're starting to really enable people to, you know, uh, write code in Python and execute the code with zero check on the code, you know, bash scripts, you name it, right? What, what's your take on, on the lack of, of security? So... This, this is a good question. So, so let me think, what is my take on that? So, I mean, I'm not sure that it's very different than a human developer. So, so um, um, let's, let's, so if we have in the team, we have like, we have human developers, right? Who write codes for Reviate. So when they make that code, that goes into a CI pipeline, right? So the pipeline just checks, like, you know, is it adhering to all standards? Didn't, didn't it break anything, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see why something like um, AutoGPT couldn't do that too, right? So- Oh, sure. If, they don't do it. it. To be clear, they have no checks right now on the, the code base. That's, you know, that's sure, 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 sure. The, sure, but but that is, like a, that is like a thing that if you would hire a human developer, um, uh, so, for example, if you hire a human developer being uh, as a, to work on a, on a government project, I mean, I, I have some friends who do that. Uh, they get a lot of background checks, you know, before they <laughs> before they allowed to 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 write that, that single line of code. You can do that for these automated things as well, right? right? So it's like, okay, what's the? But, but it's just it, a different type of background check. Fact, I guess my question is more about the fact that it seems you know open source projects in AI particularly seem to forget about cyber. And they give away these tools and everybody can go and download, you know, auto GPT and all these tools and they zero security in it and done tons of CVs. They let the bot write code and, and execute the code with zero checks whatsoever, no pipeline, no nothing. 
don't you think there's a like, kind of a lack of awareness of cyber awareness when it comes to the AI community to do better at at least warning people like, hey, this this bot can generate any code, and we're going to execute that in this sandbox containerized thing, and we don't do any check on what it's going to run. I think that you know that should be. I mean, that's pretty scary to me. I don't know. No, no, no. So I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that's the same thing for um, uh, um, uh, for for human developers, right? So sure. this morning, this morning, purely by coincidence, I couldn't use my banking app, hmm. and that somehow makes me nervous because I work in tech, right? <laughs> so the, you know what I mean? It's like a yeah. there was probably a human deployment that somewhere did something wrong. In that right. deployment, and therefore I could. I mean, your money that, was you know, gone. Your money was gone. That's right. It's it's a it's a. So back in the the early days of uh, I've I've rem I remember that. So obviously I was an early adopter of uh, 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 you know switching uh, um, uh, to to like having the app my bank for my bank the app on my phone etc. I remember in the very early days that sometimes you just opened like your account and it said zero. And I was like, "Why?" Right. And then I was like, "Oh, sorry, it was a mistake. It's back." <laughs> exactly. Right. And and the so so the point that I'm trying to make is, I am not disagreeing with you that there should be some form of like you know um, uh, um, uh, uh, checks and and balance and those it's kind of things. Baked in security. Baked in security. It, it is just it's just but we need it in humans too. <laughs> That's my point. Right. I guess my fear is, you know, these tools are widely available, including in the hands of non-coders. And I'm just afraid that uh, people are not paying attention to it. And it's great. It's going to create a wave of, of cyber issues, which will in turn um, impact the trust uh, in, to the industry when it comes to generative AI, right? Because if there is some massive cyber event, and let's say someone ends up using AutoGPT to start writing malware, which, you know, people can do. Um, and, and obviously there's zero checks and no balances. And I, I guess my fear is the ripple effect of that to the industry, but I, I, I get, I get your point there. If I, I uh, if I may flip it, if I may flip the argument though, it's like, it's also a huge business opportunity, right? So that that's oh, yeah. uh, no cybersecurity uh, tools for, for, you know, for a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And in fact, you know, I like to always think about the pros and that's my business brain you know that's why i founded uh, 13 companies i guess but it's i always think of that first um doesn't mean you know doesn't mean i don't know what others are going to do to create issues but you know that's also my cyber brain i guess um yeah. so when you when you you know you mentioned before right that uh the machine learning models are stateless uh that's important right um you know people were worried about you know chat gpt ingesting their data, which, you know, you know, these, obviously when you don't pay, OpenAI has that policy to say, you know, everything you type effectively gets, uh, you know, potentially later on fine tuned into the next generation of the models. So first, can you clarify what you mean by, by stateless? Yes. So this was um, uh, uh, something that a concept that popped into my mind. I was coincidentally with a uh, uh, I had a conversation with actually with a with a with a, um, a U.S. official actually who asked me a couple of questions about these kind of things, and and she asked me a question, and it just this popped into my mind that I said the I said the the model is uh, in tech sorry in technology we use terminology like technology is stateful. Or it's stateless. So an example of something that's stateless is an MP3 file, right? So if I have like an MP3 file of my favorite artist, and I I, I copy paste that, so I just do Command C Command V and I send it to you, or I just email it to you, uh, Nick. Then we both have these stateless MP3 files. They create value. I enjoy the music. You enjoy the music. But it doesn't per se mean that it changes or that we can both, from a business perspective, can capture value twice from the model. On the other hand, we have stateful things, right? So we have, I don't know, if you take Word, for example, and you write a letter and you save the letter and you open the letter again, then it keeps state. So it shows you the letter, right? So And that's for you a different letter than it, than it shows for me now. The, um, uh, the, the models are stateless. So that means that the moment that they're done training, they're not changing anymore. This is why you see, um, uh, if you ask, second it, like, time. just second time, 
yes. So if you say, you know, who's the current, you know, president of the U.S. and if it's like trained after, uh, sorry, before that there was a change in 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 uh, officials, then the model doesn't know. It will give the wrong answer because it had that cutoff time because it is stateless. So that is what I mean with the models being stateless and the vector databases they bring state to the models but why it's important i think is that if a lot of questions now being asked like how will the models develop how will the vector databases develop and that i think if you look back at history how technology ha has been developing technology being stateless has been developing and technology is being stateful has been developing uh, that's different so i think for example i the reason i took mp3s as an example is that if you look at everything that happened when music got digitized, you know the um, uh, how the um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the how do you call it the the music producers etc. How they got like very nervous about this. I think the same thing is going to happen for uh, uh, the businesses around um, uh, the models, right? So you you need to find out for stateful businesses the business model is different for stateless businesses right so right. that's why i use that that terminology so and it's interesting that the model is stateless right it doesn't keep state yeah no sorry so you know we talk about i guess using you know something like we to to bring data enterprise data right to those models to start augmenting the knowledge on top of the model without fine-tuning uh the models which you know again if you fine-tune data into a model then you cannot control who gets to see what and how, and you don't, you know, you don't really know. It becomes kind of this black box in a sense, and you lose kind of the ability to, to bring the references and all the stuff we talked about. So, you know, what we do here at Assage is we use WeVA as an embeddings to train data on top, and then, you know, we can control with labels the, the, the data, and we can say, you know, this user has access to this label, that user doesn't, so he doesn't get to see this WeVA object here but he's going to see this one instead. So, uh, you know, we had to build a whole uh, label-based access control stack around WeVA to be able to uh, enable labels of the data and then label users so they have access to, to, the, to the right uh, data set. So how, how do you bring, uh, I guess, what else could you do to do that securely and, and what did we miss? So, um... So what, what you do, so what's interesting about the word secure, of course, is that um, underlying on doing something securely is trust. And what what might be interesting is that it's actually a great place where open source is helping. So because the thing is basically you can um, you can see what you're adopting, right? So you see what it actually, it's like opening the hood of buying a new car, right? So you see what's under right. the hood. And look, okay, I trust this car. I think this car is going to solve the problem that I have. Um and then you bring it inside your secure environment. So now today, that's often uh, the, the virtual private cloud with one of the uh, hyperscalers. I mean, you still, of course, have like the very traditional on-prem, but of course, that's getting more and more inside the, the virtual private cloud. So to answer your question or the question that's on the, on the screen, I think that's a mixture of um, what people love about SaaS. So the easy to useness of like SaaS, but doing that hybrid inside their vir virtual private cloud. Right. So we, 100%. we call that hybrid sense, right? Yeah. Oh, is that how you call it? So I always, you know, we need a new name and we need a name for that. I don't know if hybrid SaaS is, is the name, but at least for people that, you know, that's actually how government will consume most software, in fact, right? Because they want the SaaS experience, but they want it hosted on their Kubernetes cluster inside of some government gov cloud enclave. And yeah. so that's what you're talking about is delivering effectively containers or something like that, Helm charts and whatever, you know, orchestration stuff inside yeah. of the customer enclave so that you, you, the customer has full single tenancy control of that enclave. But yet it still gets the software as a SaaS offering in terms of the billing and the support and all that kind of stuff. Yes, it, yes. And, and this is, again, also the nice thing where the open source plays a role because Rather than saying, okay, so for example, as you said, like in, in GovCloud, right? Rather than say, okay, here you have this black box that you can deploy inside your, your GovCloud. We're going to say, no, 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 Th this is what you're getting. It's open source. The whole world can see it. And now we're going to package it up for you and you can deploy that securely in, inside your GovCloud. So, and that is what, there's a trust element around security that I'm a big believer in. So someone was asking a question. I'm going to bring it up now because it kind of makes sense, um, you know, and I guess it goes back to 
misunderstanding of, of you know open source and how open source company can even survive and, and some do well and some don't you know you've seen docker for example struggle compared to what they could have done um you know i guess someone is asking you know once someone buys your your product how is he going how are you going to keep getting more income from those customers to support your business but you know maybe you know that person doesn't even understand that effectively your product is open source. They don't have to buy it to start using it. So, so it's even more complex, right? So how do you convince someone to take this open source product and not just use it without paying you? Yeah. So, so the, the, um, uh, this is a great question. And if I, if I might alter the question a little bit to capture also what you're saying, Nick is the, um, uh, because the, the answer to this question is actually pretty straightforward, right? So it's a recurring model, right? So people, they don't pay in one-off price. They, they pay on a monthly right. basis as long as usage-based, so as long as they use it, right? And how much they use it. So that's that's how they do it. Yeah, in fact, but, share, share a little bit also how you you, you price yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. so so um, we have fully usage-based pricing for our SaaS. And we're a young company, so we're also experimenting like in how we do that. But what I do find very important is that pricing is fair. So that means that people, uh, that they pay for what they use, right? So I'm not going to charge a startup, but I'm, uh, you know, that just has uh, 100 data objects. I mean, that's a little, uh, that's not a good example, but like uh, 10,000 data objects um, uh, and low, you know, security requirements for that matter, or not as a startup, often not a requirement at all versus, uh, well, for example, a government use case with with with, with billions of data objects with very high sure. security standards, right? So that's completely different uh, a way of of, of of pricing and doing those kind of things. So, but I think what's um, uh, um, so so the answer to that is that it's full use based priced. But if you tie that to the open source, is that um, you know if people and, use and, open and just to be clear, do yeah. do you tie it to the to the objects? Is that how the price point? is driven the volume of objects or the instances or what it, because there's so many different ways to do volume so what a kind of volume yeah, are you so driving have, the price yeah from? so our, our SaaS offering is based on volume of of data objects and and nowadays we also have the factory embedding in there but that's with because of innovations in reviate that's probably going to go away so just on the amount of data objects that you have so the more data you store and query the, the more you pay basically for a yep. hybrid SaaS, that's done around the metric of uh, memory and and cpus that people uh, leverage so the bigger use case the bigger machines you need uh, um uh, and then so it could be know, the more... same instance running is just getting beefier and yes. because of volume of consumption and you pay by CPU or memory or both, I guess. Well, both, how, both, the, both, okay. both. Yeah, it's a mixture of both. And and the thing is that what's interesting here is the um, uh, 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 and and then again the role of open source is that you know a lot of people if they just you know are happy using open source because they have a small use case or those kind of things that's fine. And and because it's just you know it it's like they give us feedback or they help us or sometimes you don't hear anything from them at all and they just happy users that's also fine. So um, that's the life of open source, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I so I am not. I I I'm not sure if I agree with the with the. I'm afraid part of that. I think it's a beautiful model, right? It's a way. It right, just, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you know, you know, it's just what it is. I guess, yeah. Yeah, it's like a. It's like you know, if I if I if I buy a bottle of you know perfume, I always get a few testers. So um, I don't have to pay for it for the testers, right? So. Um, uh, uh, and then if I like one, I might buy a bottle, right? So it's a very organic way of doing business right? because right. some people go like, Hey, we try that to open source. We like it. It's great. But now we want to go to production. Uh, we want to have the right, uh, the right agreements and those kind of things. So that's like a, it's a very organic so really way. It's a pull model, right? Just like a red app kind of model where, where effectively people would pay ready for the support, right? Yeah. And then the better you get as a company. So that is basically what are the proprietary piece of technology that we have is the operationalization of the database. So right. the day we, one and day two yeah. posting of the stuff. We are better at doing that than uh, uh, sure. than you. And we take that off your plate. So you just don't have to care right. about it. You right? provide the full day one, yes. day two report of the, yes. the stuff. Yes. But you're not doing like some companies, which I kind of hate. Uh, you know, we are pretending to be open source companies and keep adding pretty much critical features like ICAM and, you know, uh, SAML and, and basic things as a paid feature that is closed source on top of open source, they call it cost, right? Commercial of the shelf, uh, open, commercial open source software, which is a scam for cuts because really 
you know, most enterprise will need SAML and, and all these basic features they are putting as, as a paid um, closed source feature. So you're not yet you know, doing any of that stuff in terms of like, you know, adding, a, having feature that are not open source. Other so, than the orchestration stuff, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't we do not do that. I think it's a, it really depends also on your business because I do appreciate the fact that somebody wants to make money in their business. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, but then just, uh, just on it, just call yourself a cop. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And that that is something you know, that is you just that like is don't hide that... behind open tools and be like we're open tools, but not already, yeah. but we are you know, just no, I'm by the way, not... our stage is closed tools, we're not open tools, I own it, I'm not pretending we're something else, you know. No, no, so, no, no, but exactly so you're I... real, you're real open tools, you're real, you're yes. the real deal. Yeah, but it's it's super simple because it's like you if you just go to uh, there's just an open source, the open source I think it's just open source.org or something. It's just very mm -hmm. clear if the software has license X. It's open source. It has <laughs> license. Why? It's not. It's like a. It's there's no. There's not much right. to debate. And to be honest, Nick, I mean, it's you know, it's it's a free country, right? So people can 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 use any license that they want. That's I just, right. which I'm with you that I appreciate it. If people are just very clear at what they're what they're what the model transparency is, is good. Right. Yes, yes. 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 So effectively, your bet is you know to answer the user question is well you know if if we if we build a good open source product, people are going to want to use it in production, and most people are going to want some some support, and we're going to be there to do that uh, yeah. as a recurring you know revenue to support the the product. So it's 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 for, but also the, just the the operations, right? So just making sure that right. the thing yeah. is running and that yeah, and, and running it and yeah. and you know yeah. making sure. That even even if it's yeah. on your uh, hybrid SaaS, uh, you still can provide the support, you know, for people to to have it yeah. up and running and with the right SLA and, and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So now you know, obviously you are gap ready. That's why we picked you, right? Um, why did you feel like you know a lot of you know you look at Pinecone and all these guys, right? The SaaS only. You know, they have no interest, you know, although they just announced, you know, an Azure uh, marketplace offering. But, um, you know, they, they really have no easy way to instantiate a replica uh, on a single tenant basis of, of Pinecone or whatnot. Right. What made you and I think, by the way, that's part on. Right. Because the world is going to move to hybrid SaaS. I actually think SaaS is going to die. Uh, with Kubernetes and containers, I think people, uh, particularly you know, big enterprise and stuff, maybe not the small, you know, tiny stuff, but the the big stuff is going to be hybrid SaaS for everything. I think. So I think you you did very well. But what drove you to make the decision? Because it's a lot of work, but it's it's not too much work too if you do it right, which you did, you know, by containerizing and and building your product the way you did. But what drove you to make the decision? So the the answer is going to be surprisingly easy. Because customers ask, hmm. right? Did it's you like, think it's of like, it before? Did you? Was it? You know, oh. did, when you? I mean, when you designed it, it was containerized and you know easy to deploy, so it wasn't very hard, right? No, of course we we we. I mean, so me and my girlfriend, we have like our also our background working, of course, in 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 enterprise software. So we kind of we kind of knew that so that was an ask. So yeah, we kind of, but it was also, but it's it's, but you're never hundred percent sure before, like customers tell you. And yeah. and they do, and what I and but to give a little bit more color to that answer. So what I absolutely agree on with you is that the state of the of the cloud becomes um, uh, uh, um, uh, it, the state of the of the cloud is becoming better, better, and better to actually do these kind of things, right? So um, uh, it becomes it, it's still hard, but it becomes easier and easier over time to do these kind of things. And everything that we're driving is based on um, uh, on what you what users ask, right? So uh, a couple of years, uh, sorry, not years, a couple of months ago, all of a sudden people wanted to go to like the the all of a sudden the billion skill was a thing multiple customers asked at some point some customers asked about like multi-tenancy so we did that uh, other customers asked about certain modules so that is how we keep developing all these kind of things inside the weave gate but all with that focus of being able to do that in the um uh uh um uh in you know in, in the i mean we also have SaaS, but th there's a sure. there's a direction you towards like the hybrid SaaS. yeah yeah 
So, you know, Jared, who is working for Defense Unicorn, who is also <laughs> using, uh, which, you, you know, you know, um, also using WeVA, um, and, you know, was asking actually about the multi-tenancy stuff, right? I missed that, actually, so I, I, I'm not tracking um, that. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, so I guess a customer ask you for multi-tenancy, does that mean effectively on the single instance you can now segment data in a different way than just maybe doing some schemas and objects and things. Uh, yes, and and the reason. So thanks, Jared, for asking. This the reason I'm I I had to smile when you popped this one up. One thing that we've learned is like these uh, user and customer requests they come in waves. So yeah, all of a sudden we had like all these people like upvoting and asking multi tenancy. We're like, okay, great, thank you. Let's. Get it done, right? Get it over with. So uh, it's 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 um uh, um. Uh, so the short answer to Gary's question is yes. It's like in the latest version of Wavejet, and it's also you can find the documentation how to how to set it up. Um. Uh. But this is this is well. This is exactly how it goes with the community, right? So people like Jared ask these kind of things. Like, okay, thank you. This is apparently a thing. We're gonna make sure that it happens. So uh, and now to the the second part of the of the question. Uh, if it overlaps with his um, uh, uh, decision, um, well, kind of. It kind of overlaps in the sense of like customers ask, like, can you run it inside the VPC? Um, and then the if then the answer to that question is yes. And then the, sometimes the next question is like, okay, but because it's very important that we can do that, that we have multi-tenancy features, backup features, etc. And then if there's a feature that we're missing or lacking, then we just make sure it gets built. It's just it's as simple as that, to be honest. Right. And just to clarify, right, because I, you could already already do multi-tenancy before in a sense of doing schemas and filtering by, you know, creating a source type or, or doing something to, to filter the objects, but it wasn't baked in, I guess, into the product. You, you could still cheat the product, I guess, and make it do multi-tenancy in some ways. But are you also saying it's also doing multi-tenancy on the management of the object and, like, creation, deletion? And stuff like that now, so you can have different kind of schemas, and and everybody would not see the same schemas across the the instance. Is that how this works? I guess. So it's like it's you 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 set it indeed based on the on the schema. I have to say that I don't. That's what you're asking is actually a very good question. How users see? I don't know that to be honest by by heart. So that's that's but of course that's in the in the. That's in okay. The we'll find but out. The, we'll look. We're gonna read the freaking manual. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> yeah. No. But it, what's right. funny about this is that the, we learned. It, I actually have a funny war story about that because we learned about multi tenancy that. So a couple of months ago. People were just so for just for those listening who don't know. So we've had in we've had you create like like you have this, you, you create these classes. So you can say for example document or image and those kind of things, and then you add your data objects to it. And it's kind of, kind of a table. table for, I mean, it's kind of a way of yeah. thinking of a table, you know, exactly. for, for that database, yeah. right? So. Yes. And in a couple of months ago, people were just storing just all their data just in one, right? So just, one. just in, yeah. in one class or one table, as you said, so just one, right? Then all of a sudden, people were like, no, 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 no. We still have like maybe a, a data set of a billion, but we just in small chunks, right? So we have these different uh, classes or tables. And then we had a uh, uh, we had a customer um, uh, uh, who went uh, viral. Uh, uh, their product went viral. So what they did is every time one of the customers signed up for them, they created a new they created a new class, and those kind of things. And uh, with them going viral, they had a problem with the database because mm. we just had not seen that use case yet. So they screamed fire. <laughs> and we started to help out with that. So that's how we learned for the first case. For the, that was the first case where we learned about how people wanted to use. Also, that's also important, multi-tenancy. Uh, a GitHub issue was created. And all of a sudden, we saw like all these companies and people up for it. Yeah, we need this, we need this, we need this. That's how we yeah. learn. So I don't know what the next thing is, but um, it's it, that's again the beauty of open source. People tell you what they need, and right. um, and, and multi tenancy is a great example of that. Yeah, uh, you know the way we we ended up doing it is we we do have more than one object, but but we do have a type field, and that's mm. how we can you know uh, filter, and then we have a data set where you know each user is controlling their data ownership of that object, and then uh, they can assign read-only rights to, to other users um, yeah. so that they are visible to others. So yeah. um, now, you know, what can you say about the role of Weavey inside of this wider AI ecosystem? Is this just like this database 
geeky thing that's going to connect a bunch of things. And now you're also bringing bridges to embeddings and automation, you know, with a vector generation, you know, which at first I'm like, why, why am I going to use WeVA to generate my, my embeddings if I used to just do it directly, you know, with OpenAI or whatnot? You know, wh why do we need WeVA in the middle of this? Sounds like, you know, bloated or, you know, I mean, there's concern of vendor lock-in or whatnot. So, so what do you see kind of the limitation, you know, because everything can become bloated and you look at Langchain and it's, you know, 1,200 CVEs and it's so bloated that, you know, Jared and I were talking about it. We, we don't want to use it because it's, it's so bloated. It's, it's insane, you know. So how do you control that blue and how do you say, okay, that's where we stop. That's where we start. That's where we bring value. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I think so. The uh, that's like, that's actually that's a great question. So I think that the um, there's so first of all, the vector embedding is a new data type, right? So uh, we have a database that deals with dealing with that data type, right? That's, that's it kind of makes sense to do it. I agree. I agree. Exactly. So that's a, that's a very common thing. But then the next question becomes: Okay, so what do people expect from that database? So for example, you had before uh, the, these databases started to emerge, you had um, an, an excellent uh, Facebook project, right? Face, which is just, there's some very high quality engineering in that, in that piece of, of technology. But the thing is that it was, it's not a product, right? So it's a tool that Facebook open sourced that, that they use for their own needs. So mm -hmm. people started to use it, but they started to ask questions, right? So, oh, can I also filter over this? Oh, can I also store my data object with it? Oh, can I do X, can I do Y? So, and and uh, what's interesting, for example, with, with Reviate is the modular ecosystem that we have. So you can bring your own embeddings. You, If you want to do that, that's fine. So you can just store your data object and bring your own embedding. But some people say, no, we prefer to use a module that does it for us. So they can be the OpenAI module, the Cohere module, Transformer module, whatever they have, right? Um, uh, so you have optionality in using these these modules to do that, and I think that kind of captures the um, uh, um, uh, you know the, the 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 range where we where we want to go. I think what's more important is the the use cases that we that we focus on. So I really think that's also what it says on our on our website. We use the term on our homepage. There's AI native, right? We I strongly believe. That, the, that this new paradigm of writing and creating technology with with AI, a, what we call AI enabled by these factorization models, the, the generative models, um, that new paradigm, we need to help people to give them the right tooling from an infrastructure perspective to work with that. And and everything that that's that's in there, that that's contained in there. Um, uh, so so that that's that's how we look at it. So we don't go further than basically these modules. But for example, multi tenancy is a great example. Right? So people ask for that. So that's a feature you add. I, yeah, I don't that's... feel that. Yeah, I, I don't feel that's become good. Right. I think your help job, There's a lot of optional things that bring a lot of containers for different things. Yeah, and True. and it's starting to be, you know. Healthy, I guess I'm gonna use the word <laughs> healthy. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's fair point. I, I'm just afraid if you keep going that that route too long, mm -hmm. it's gonna become tough, right? Um, yeah. Not yeah. only to understand and, and maintain, and I mean the helm, the charts itself um, has so many parameters now because of these other, um, you know, modules, right? Uh, which have to do with, you know, it's directly related to the product, and I get it. Um, I'm just worried about adoption, I guess. But I guess that's where you you shine and and come do it for people, so they don't have to learn the the helm chart, and you can do it for them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think so. Most people currently also just use it through through Docker, right? So that's that's how they how they right. how they use it. It's like it's it's interesting. Kubernetes is is interesting when it comes to that because operationalizing it is just um uh, that's just that's how we do. It. We we on Kubernetes. Yeah. We we you know exactly. we were probably the first one of the first with you guys to. Uh, uh, yeah. Running on Azure, you know, and uh, fix that that nightmare of Azure. No, license, so. but it's it's a good question, right? So it's like a it's a um, uh, uh, the question is like how many dials and knobs do you want to make available? Um, right. Uh, it's that's that's always it's that's it's a complex question, right? So LT is even... fine. Beyond LT is bloated, so you know. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. Fair enough, fair enough. But it's like a it's a. Uh, and I don't think we will see a lot more when it comes to these the model providers, right? So I think that's also kind of we see now who the players in the field are. So that's, right. you know, that's yeah. I don't that, know though. These newcomers every freaking day. That's my fear. Is like yeah, fair enough. Is that gonna stop? <laughs> and then how many are gonna, you're gonna have to support? You know, at what point do you decide to support one? You know, is just like okay, 
every if you if you have to support everybody that could come out and and die within a year, you know. Anyway, that's another whole discussion. That's that's a fair point. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, it's just you know something to to think about, um, because it also increases your 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 attack surface and and the product you know blow and and all that for cyber. Um, so you know people are saying to say, well, you know, why don't you use Redis, right? I don't need Weave uh, Elastic is now bragging about vectors, you know, Redis uh, vector option stuff in there. Why do I need a vector database? Why can't I just use my Elastic stack? No, the thing is, you can, right? So it's like a. I think the 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 there are two parts of the answer here. So um, the vector embedding is a new data type. So databases um, uh, supporting that new data type, I think, is great, right? So that just shows that there's a need for the database. Uh, sorry, for the data type. The thing stays that databases are good at specific. Um, uh, um, uh, the, the database are good at different ways of performing and and you know being operationalized. So um, like you have for different types of database uh, data types specific build databases, we see the same thing with Weaviet, right? So where you just basically say like, okay, you know, we have a, a database that's built around the uh, uh, the vector embedding. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is like the things that people built with V8 are different, right? So it's like, for example, what you're working on, uh, what you showed at the beginning, right, Nick? So these Gen AI-based applications where people feed stuff into the Gen AI models, where they interact with the models. We have something what we call like a generative feedback loops where you store data back into the database. So being a place where people go to build these AI native applications, I think that's, that is that is what makes us different, right? So that we see a lot of people build end-to-end -end things on top of uh, with it because they think AI first, right? That is their way of thinking. They're not thinking of like enhancing something existing or those kind of things. So um, you just you, you just talked about like uh, um, um, uh, uh, like have bloated. So it's it's interesting. So if people because the thing is this, and Nick, if if a database provider adds a vector search to the to um, to their database, that has a huge impact. That means you have another index. You need to manage that index. And that index, that comes with certain trade-offs. So if you have a database that is good at doing something, but you add a index that might be a suboptimal combination of the two together, then you might potentially be shooting yourself in the foot, right? So in Weaviate, you can do, technically speaking, you can do keyword search in Weaviate. I'm not going to tell people to do, if people have a keyword search use case, you know, use Solar or Elastic. Or open source, whatever, right? right. So Did it's you a. You see, you see what I mean? Though? No, I mean being specialized makes a lot of sense, right? And you know they would become bloated, of course. The other issue, I, I guess, I'm afraid about is, you know, a lot of people have to ingest data sitting in Elastic into EVA so that they can do generative AI stuff. So now you're ingesting data twice. Does that make sense for an enterprise to have data in two different places? So uh, I would argue no. So that is the reason why in Weaviate you can store the complete data object like you would store it in, in Elastic or like you would store it in MongoDB, right? You store the complete data object with the vector embedding attached to it. There is a use case though where having the, the data in multiple places is actually, I would argue, a good architectural choice. And that is often in combination with a data warehouse. So if you have right. a data warehouse where you say like, okay, we're going to store all all our historical data, everything that we have in there, right? We have a, a, a storage and compute separated for all the obvious reasons. Uh, so let's take, let's say that you're a huge wholesaler, right? Then you have like a product catalog from day one, right? Which is huge. But for the e-commerce applications you have, you might not need all of that data. So then basically, so that's why we, for example, in Weave, you have the Spark connector. So that people can right. make a spark connection between the data warehouse and Weaviate, which is a very common pattern, right? Um, so that is um, uh, um, uh, uh, that's that is a use case where I see multiple databases play a role in harmony, which is actually also a very common uh, use case. Here we go. Makes sense. All right. So we already answered this. So what is uh, generative search? You 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 kind of uh, you know brought it up. What is it meaningful? What is it? 
Um, so, so generative search is, and we kind of already talked about this, right? Is where you uh, uh, inject search results into the generative model. So, so that's the, a fancy the name for it. Yeah. So it so really like, enables the, the enterprise data and, and augmenting your prompt knowledge and the LLM knowledge. Yes, and where it's interesting, right? So where it's where it's val where it's valuable is the uh, the fact that you can do stuff with that. So the the most obvious use case is the chatbot case. But we also have on our website a blog post written by my colleague Connor um, where we create, we call it generative feedback loops where um, we have an, an, uh, just a public data set of Airbnb listings without a description. So what you do is basically you query over these descriptions and you basically say, okay, um, now generate a description for these, this listing and store that back in the database. So now you can do semantic search over these listings that were generated and not in the original data set. So those kind right. of use cases with generative search is something that I'm very, um, um, I'm very bullish on that. So that people start to build more and more of those kind of things. All right. So what's next? What was the next big thing? So I'm very much, um, I'm a big believer in the multimodal models, right? And and how as uh, a- To tell world... people what, what that means. So the, yeah, so if we, the, the most used models right now is large language models, right? So, and then the second L is language. And um, uh, that's just one modality, right? Language. But we're seeing more and more models that just can ingest or output different modalities. So you can tell the model, um, okay, for example, a generative model, you can say, okay, um, uh, um, I want you to generate something that is text, or I want you to generate something that is an image, or I want you to generate something that's a heat map, or those kind of things. And uh, that is something I'm super excited about. And um, uh, that is also one of one of the things that I believe, going back to what we said about um, uh, 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 with WeFit, I believe that our users, they want to store the data object with that embedding. So to be prepared for multimodality, if someone says, okay, I just want to store an image, right, with the multimodal model, then we should be able to, to support storing that image, right? So you just have one place to go mm. rather than to go all these different databases, but all purposely built around the embedding. I think that's the most important thing. That's, that is the core focus. And then around that, you can store the data object and it can be text. Most is now text today, but that can also be an image or an audio file. Right, so it could be binary, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's binary. Yeah, it can be binary. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So, you know, looking at this technology, and you see a lot of people using it in many different ways. Is it going to change the world, or is it just a buzzword? Is it a gimmick? Well, is it going to stick? Uh, when you think of generative AI, how much how much impact is it going to have in the world? So, I mean. What is super interesting to see is that the, the models reach the tipping point from being like, oh, this is going to be something very cool. And at now this tipping point, like it's good enough, right? Where people say like, hey, we really, uh, 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 we can see the value and we can we use it in our business, right? So I think that we're beyond this. So for example, what we saw with, um, uh, so for example, blockchain, for example, that was constantly struggling with like, what's that really that, really that use case that will take off, right? And um, that now has proven itself in, in, in Gen AI that, that's, that it's there, right? So to, to interact with these models. So um, uh, so now to ask the end with the last question, how do I see that change the world? Well, I see that in the form of that it's that paradigm shift, right? So it's a completely new paradigm to interact with the technology, to build new products, to build new solutions. So there's like this world opening up for people to build new things right that help other people and i'm super excited about that is that going to disrupt jobs uh, probably yeah probably yeah yeah what, what what would you say to people in terms of like trying to find a way to make sure you have a you have a future job now with this new technology what, what should they do to make sure they're still relevant moving moving forward <laughs> Yeah, so I think that goes for every technological um, development. If something is very re repetitive, right, that is like a something that can be automated. So everything you do where creativity is involved, um, in any way, shape, or form, you can be in. You can be. In, I had like an interesting uh, conversation with a lawyer, right, and 
and um, he told me, is it like, you know, if I, if I, you know, if, if I'm working with them and then they, they're drafting something for me, then that's actually work. It's, it's great if the Jenny, I can do that for you. Where the added value of the uh, of the lawyer comes is like when, for example, when there's a discussion about certain language or those kind of things, or how you position the business or, or those kind of things, where they help that create that creative element it can also be with an accountant right. or what have you. That is what's so valuable, right? So um, uh, I'm very I'm I'm very bullish on this because it's like a yes, it will disrupt certain uh, jobs, but it will also enable people to be more creative, right? To create more creative content more creative products, more newer products, other products, those kind of things. So um, uh, will it be disruptive? Yes, but I think for the good, because it just allows people to be more creative. All right, last question before we let you go. Uh, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? So, um, uh, uh, so uh, I mean, uh, there's there's a hype, uh, uh, you know, happening in the whole AI space. I, I think we cannot deny that, and 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 luckily we see a lot of people um, um, uh, enjoying the fruits of that. But there's still also a lot of research happening in the space, or companies like us. A lot of engineering is happening. So I want to make sure that people um, uh, uh, understand where the technology actually is, right? Uh, beyond the hype so that we can help them go to production and build these new products. So that keeps me up at night. So on one hand, a hype is nice because it makes all boats flow. You know, it it, it, it just, it, it, it rise, that's a rising tide. So that's nice. The thing that was like, um, uh, you want to make sure that people are also aware what the, where we are as an industry, right? And I don't mean fact the base, but like just AI in general and how we can help people. So that keeps me up at night. So how can we make sure that we help you? Because otherwise we make, you know, uh, we might make foolish decisions uh, as an industry at large uh, too soon. So um, that that's that I would say that would that keeps me up at night. All right. Well, you know, Bob, you've done us a great uh, favor to come on the show and and share all your insights. I think a lot of people have learned a lot today, and I think it's it's been a, a game changer for for most people on the show. Uh, I wanted to thank you. I'm going to give you the last words. You know, so let people know where to reach out. And if they want to learn more about uh, Weavey, uh, what to do. But uh, thanks, thanks again for joining us today. Well, again, thanks so much for having me and 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 um, all these wonderful questions. Uh, so the, if they go to the website, just Weavey.io, or if they use um, uh, uh, any ser uh, uh, consumer search engine <laughs> they want to use and just type in Weavey, they'll find us. Uh, it's open source. You can find me um, just under my name on LinkedIn and on Twitter. I'm always happy to answer questions or connect with people. So again, uh, you know, to everybody, thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you in two weeks. In the meantime, let's make sure you keep up the good work to ensure that our kids have a fighting chance at winning against China 20 years from now. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.